Okay, and what I want to do is I'm going to give you a bit of a survey over a project which I've been involved in a long, long time. Um, and I want to tell you some newish results about that as well. And this is a project that's sort of intimately involved with Elisha as well, even though much of it he's not been directly involved. And the story starts in 2005. I spent the best part of a year in Paris with Elisha. And I was doing one thing, trying to work out some of the things that Rich Schwartz was doing and trying to reprove some of his results. And Julien, who was a PhD student at the time, had just been given a problem by Alicia to see if we, he could construct any more non-arithmetic lattices. And suddenly we were having this conversation and we realized that, that what I was doing and what Julien was doing, uh, they came together. So we started working together on, on this. Before very long, Martin became involved. And while well, we've been working together on this ever since, practically, um, but it's a beautiful story and I want to tell you a bit of this. So um, there will be some joint work with, maybe I can mention these names now because I'll forget later. Um, with Martin and Julien. And some of the stuff at the very end is going to be uh, joint with my PhD student. Okay, so this is supposed to be a nice general talk. So let's start out with something that we, well, we've heard a little bit about already, but we, we all, all know quite well. So if I, have, if I have a line and a reflection, and I have another line and a reflection, so maybe we have a reflections R1 and R2. And maybe I have an angle alpha in between them. If I look at the product of the reflections R1 and R2, then they, they, they give me a rotation through angle 2 alpha. So. And so similarly, if I extend this out and I come down with a third reflection R3, and I can probably put a beta and a gamma. And then we're going to think about triangle groups, which are the groups generated by R1, R2, and R3. And we know that when alpha, beta, and gamma are all pi divided by an integer, then that group is discrete, and we get a beautiful tessellation by images of this triangle. So, so if we have alpha equals pi over p, beta is pi over q, gamma is pi over r. And we also know that, that, um, that when 1 over p plus 1 over q plus 1 over r is bigger than 1, we get a spherical triangle equals 1, we get a Euclidean triangle, and less than one, we get a hyperbolic triangle. We all know these things. I'm saying these things because they're very basic, but we're going to have analogous things coming in later on. Just one more thing is if, I, if, if my two lines uh, did not intersect, then they have a common perpendicular. And if I look at how uh, the, 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 the R1 and R2, and both of those group elements stabilize the common perpendicular, and I'm going to get a dihedral group acting on, in fact, an infinite dihedral. In fact, I always have a dihedral group acting on each of those points, or on a little uh, the sphere of directions around those points. So we're going to get a dihedral group. Right. So that's, that's a sort of, just keep this in the back of your mind. Mathematical objects are really interesting if you can describe them in many, many different ways, because that gives you little bits of a dictionary between different areas of mathematics. And these triangle groups are exactly uh, one such. So these triangle groups, 
Well, and I'm always, from now on, going to assume that 1 over p plus 1 over q plus 1 over r is less than 1, so that we can then, so we get, um, so we can describe using hyperbolic geometry. So we're going to get some nice pictures of tessellations by triangles and so on. That's a very poor picture, never mind. It's, it's being immortalized forevermore. But there's a, there's a different way we can describe those. And this goes back to not Schwartz with a T, but Schwartz without a T. Uh, in 1873, who showed that all of these triangle groups are monodromy groups for certain hypergeometric functions. Equations or functions. It doesn't really matter. The functions are the solutions to the equations. Okay, so <coughs> that's all beautiful. A particular example of this, e.g. the 2, 3, infinity. And again, infinity means that these two points should, should intersect off on the ideal boundary, and I effectively get a zero angle. <coughs> so that becomes, which is the modular group, or rather, the modular group is an index two orientation preserving subgroup of that triangle. I'm going to sort of be very ambiguous as to whether I talk about the, the orientation preserving group or the reflection group. Um, simply because otherwise I should forget, I'll just say that now. So that, so that corresponds to, um, uh, so that's the, that's the modular group, so monodromy modular, that should give you a clue. Uh, and so for this is for ellipt elliptic functions, or equivalently the equation uh, y squared is 4x cubed minus g2 x minus g3, well-known equation of, a, of an elliptic, uh, as elliptic pair. Okay, but, and also the modular group we can write as PSL to Z, and its discreteness is immediate from the fact that, dis, that Z is discrete inside the reals. Now, when I was a, a young PhD student, I was reading Magnus's book, and he made exactly the remark I've just made, that it was obvious that this group was discrete. Now, I knew how to construct a fundamental domain and to build a tessellation and to use the Poincaré polyhedron theorem to show that, that this was indeed discrete, and that didn't seem to be at all obvious. And it took me a very long time to realize, or probably about two months or something. Actually, it was simply because Z is discrete inside the reals, right? And that, so you have just, you focus on a geometrical intuition, which I love to do. Sometimes you just miss the blinding, the obvious, using algebra. And so that get, brings us on to the question of arithmeticity. So arithmeticity is just a fancy word to say that a group is discrete because it is um, uh, because, simply because the integers are discrete inside the reals. And I'm not going to go into a definition of arithmeticity, but I think when we were talking about the, um, the conference, then uh, I think it was Pierre suggested that if people wanted to, we could have some informal sessions, and I'm happy to have an informal session talking about arithmeticity and what it means and how you calculate it and things, if people wish to do that. So one might hope, using this, that you could just use arithmeticity to decide everything you want to know about triangle groups. Unfortunately, that's not, that's not true. So... 
Akiuchi in a series of papers in the 1970s um, showed that only finitely many triangle groups are ar arithmetic. So maybe I should have said so. So um, discreteness. I said this in words, but it's important. So it follows in a complicated way. From that of, I'm running out of space. So. Only fi so Takeuchi showed only finitely many triangle groups are arithmetic, and moreover, there are infinitely many commensurability classes of non-arithmetic triangles. Okay, so for the rest of the talk, I want to, to try to push this picture into higher dimensions, and I'm meaning higher complex dimensions. And most of the talk will be for two complex dimensions, but I'm just going to set things up a little bit because I want to say one or two things about even higher dimensions than that. So. So what do I mean by, what, 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 by this question? Well, I'm wanting to find, see if I can find some groups that are not arithmetic and to actually see how many commensurability classes I can find. And my goal would be in, I mean, this is a completely unreachable goal at the moment, would be in all dimensions to find examples of non-arithmetic lattices and to, and to find infinite many commensurability classes of, of such. And we're going to fail spectacularly with the last, last of those questions and we're only going to make a tiny, tiny bit of progress about the, the first of them. So before I continue, I'm just going to give you a bit of a digression on the history of, of arithmeticity and lattices. This And again, I haven't told you what an arithmetic group is, and um, it, it's, well, we, we could do that, but I, I want to, I'm going to take a leaf out of Alexandra's uh, book and from what I talked this morning and say, well, let's just co concentrate on some other things. I mean, I, I've given talks where I've given full definitions of arithmeticity many times, um, but, but it kind of gets a little bit tedious after a while. Okay, so... There are these things which are called um, arithmetic groups. And there are other things that are called lattices, where a lattice is a discrete subgroup of finite co-volume, where volume is measured appropriately, either using Haar measure or, or using the, the natural volume on a symmetric space, if you have one of those at hand. And how are those two things related? Well, we start out with... Morel and Harish Chandra. All arithmetic groups. Oh, lattices. I think I even have some dates down here if you if you this is 1962. And 
when Elisha was very, very small. And, okay, then, well, that's great. Well, what about the other, other way around? Um, so let's just restrict ourselves to irreducible lattices in, or in, in, in irreducible groups of non-compact type. Otherwise, we'll start having to talk about different sorts of factors and so forth. So com combining Margulis from 1984, uh, Gromov and Shane from uh, 1992, 1992, not 1922, and Corlett from 1992 says that all lattices are arithmetic except big pause while I clean the board. It's exactly the right place to have a pause because it keeps you all excited. For those of you who don't know the story. Thing. So let's just pull the board down again. Lee group G, except when G is commensurable to S O N one or S U N one. So Margulis proved it for higher rank groups of non-compact type. Uh, and then combining work of Gromoff and Shane and Corlett, they, they, they polished off the cases of SPN1 and, uh, and the, the thing for, um, uh, for the Octonians, which is, I guess, F4 F minus 20, um, which are the other two, two rank one cases. Okay. So the case... SO21, which is the same as SU11, is the case that is, that's settled by Takeuchi. It's the isometry group of the hyperbolic plane, depending on whether you like it in a, as a real or a complex uh, object. And so then, so what, what about, what's the, what's the story for all of the rest of them? So let's just polish off S, O, N, 1. There are examples, there were various examples, the low values of, of N, but then uh, it was some examples by Gromov and Piotrowski Shapiro. Piotrowski Shapiro. And roughly speaking, what happens is if you have a group there's a number field floating around, and that number field is uniquely associated with your group, and and if and if it's uh, and and then um, you can look at things that that are arithmetic, and that's that's intimately connected with the number field, and you basically take two objects with different number fields, but where you can you can cut them in the middle and, and glue them together, and then the, the, the number field doesn't work and the thing's not arithmetic. It's, that's basically the, the argument. It's much more, a little bit more sophisticated than that, but it's, that's, that's basically the idea. And the reason why this does not work it for SUN1, which is the, uh, as we've already just heard, um, the holomorphic isometries of complex hyperbolic n space. The reason why this doesn't work is that we cannot separate. Uh, there are no totally real geodesic uh, hypersurfaces. To totally, sorry, totally geodesic real hypersurfaces. Get my adjectives in the right order. Um, and so I, I can't cut cut this apart. And so I, there's, there's, 
there's been various attempts and uh, maybe we'll hear a little bit later in the week about hybrids and there's um, sort of bits of bits of a, an attempt to do that and it might might work but as yet we don't have a, an argument okay so that just leaves the case of s u n one for n bigger than or equal to two and that's where we're going to focus ourselves and, and remember that this is um, that's essentially the same as the, the isometries holomorphic isometries of h n C. So I'm going to start to use geometry a little bit more. Right. So Mosto, 1980, fantastic paper, 100 pages long, um, um, Pacific Maths Journal. It, um, he basically had to invent all of the technology that he was going to use and as much of the technology that we use today is, is in that paper. Um, it's, it's a great paper, but he constructed examples of non-arithmetic lattices PU or SU, let's, uh, let's just say SU to one, by building fundamental domains, really getting his hands dirty and building fundamental domains. As we heard earlier, um, I think it was in Vincent's talk, um, Capes and Moller have been looking, investigating commensurability classes, and so I can say that among these there are seven commensurability classes. And then the following year, completely different construction by Livne, uh, using universal elliptic curve, and uh, it's, it's again sort of, I would like to say it's an algebraic geometry construction, but it's sort of, yeah, somehow. Um, he constructed a family of groups, one of which is non arithmetic and doesn't occur in, in Mostert's group. So. so now we're up to eight commensurability classes, all in SU21. As I said at the beginning, we can view, it's good when we can view things from multiple different points of view, because then along come Delian and Mosto, and they use an idea that goes back to Picard. This is 1986. So they, <coughs> they, con they uh, constructed monodromy groups <coughs> of uh, hypergeometric functions. In several variables. Right, so let's just be clear about this. This is of degree two, equa differential equations of degree two with n variables. The H.A. Schwartz was degree two and one variable. So this is, um, okay. And they give a finite list. And so, um, and 
among these we get the Mosto and the Livnay examples plus one other commensurability class in n equals one and one example n equals two, n equals three, uh, n equals two, sorry, n equals two and n equals three, right? And that was basically, there's a big pause in the story at this point. Um, Various other constructions were given. Um, in, in, in the meantime, these examples uh, were, were, were constructed from many different points of view, but um, there were no new examples found for quite some time. I should also say among these other different points of view, we've already had it mentioned, Thurston, which again, it's hard to, hard to date this, but I'm gonna put, circa 1989, um, there was a, a preprint, uh, Shapes of Polyhedra, that was circulating as a preprint for a long, long time and eventually was published um, in the late 90s. Um, gave, a, gave a completely different point of view um, and one which I particularly like. Okay, so we have this pause. And then, um, so then we have some new examples by Martin, Julien, and myself, um, which we have 13 commensurability classes. In the meantime, um, in, I guess, 2005, um, Oh, n equals two. Kuvenberg, Heckman, and Louis Enger sort of generalized the Deline Mosto construction and Martin has shown that there's one more class n equals three. And that is basically the state of the art. So we're a long, long way from finding anything in higher dimensions than four. And you know, this goal of even trying to find infinitely many commensurability classes, well, we have, we have 22 in dimension, in dimension two and two in dimension three. Right. Um, so, what I want to do for the rest of the, the talk is to talk about these examples, these examples in dimension two, and see if we can find uh, more ways. We, I can tell you how, how to construct them, tell you a little bit more about them, and also see if we can find different ways of describing them. Okay, so that's basically where we're going to go. Okay, so oh, I don't need that. Um, let's come over to this board again because this is I want to I'm sort of putting things here that I want to sort of keep for later. I talked up there about real reflections, and I now want to talk about complex reflections. And you might actually say that um, it's not such a good name because reflection should have degree, have order two. Um, unfortunately, complex reflections have been called that for many years. And so, um, so at least since the 1950s. Um, and so we're, we're stuck with the name. 
So let's just think about what, what, a, what a real reflection is. So let's suppose that we have a hyperplane. May as well make it pass through the origin. And I have a point up here. And I want to reflect the point in the hyperplane. Well, what do I do? I, I decompose my point into something in the hyperplane plus something orthogonal to the hyperplane. And then I switch the direction. So this would be R and X. Right. That's the usual construction that we teach our first years in linear algebra about when we're talking about reflections. Okay, so if we really want to, if we want to, to be precise about that, we can put, take a, a vector n. And then my green thing is x dot n over n dot n times n. And the orange, the, the, my orange chalk has just disappeared. That's good. It is uh, x minus x dot n dot n times n. OK, that's a real reflection. Now let's try to make this whole picture complex. So now I'm going to have a complex hyperplane. And what happens in this orthogonal direction? Well, I no longer get something that's one real dimensional. I get something that's one complex dimensional. And so in the real world, that looks like a plane. And so now I can take I have an angle associated to my, re my reflection, theta. So this would be r theta of x. And oh, I, I forgot to tell you what my, wasn't, wasn't so good. My, 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 uh, my, uh, my original reflection was this minus two times that. And so now I'm going to get this point is, is x minus, um, uh, whatever, 1 plus e to the i theta times. Have I got that right? Yeah, I think I have. Um, 1 minus e to the i. Okay. Good, so that's what a complex reflection is. And the, the groups that were constructed by Mosto and by all these other characters, including Martin, Julien, and I, are groups generated by three complex reflections. So we can come back to our picture up here. And now we have, we have pictures of something that looks a bit like a triangle group, like that, except that now we have angles associated to the triangles. So, so we have so we now have complex reflections, and there are some angles associated to them. So the next question is, um, this business about the product of the reflections being a rotation of, of order, of order um, n, or p, p if it was pi over p, uh, what's the analog of that when I'm talking about complex reflections? So, let, so that's where I'm going to start to talk about braiding. So we're going to talk about So let's just motivate ourselves with the real reflections again. So if I have two reflections, R1 and R2, and I have an angle here, I think I'm going to put a Q there, then we know that R1, 
R2 to the Q is the identity. Good, we, we discovered this right at the start of the talk. I'm going to rewrite that, that equation in a slightly strange way, something that looks slightly strange. So, first, so I'm going to say then, let's just concentrate for a start on the case where Q is even. Well, I can write this as R1, R2 to the Q over 2, R1, R2 to the Q over 2 is the identity. And then I can take one of those over to the other side. one R2 inverse to the Q over two. But because they're, they're, they're real reflections, they have order two. So R1 R2 inverse is what R2 inverse R1 inverse is R2 R1. And that is an example of a generalized braid relation. And similarly, if Q is odd, we would have R1 R2 to the Q minus 1 over 2 R1 is R2 R1 R2 to the Q minus 1 over 2. So that looks like a strange way to write this, but now actually the same thing is going to be true. These relations are true in the complex world. So the, the things that you used to know about, about the product of reflections as being something to do with the angle. So I now have, um, and of course, uh, in this case, we no longer have that the in, that um, our, our I inverse is equal to our I, but, but this is the correct thing. So now for the complex reflections, We get, um, we get the same relations. We get, so these, uh, we get relations star. In other words, R1, R2 to the Q over 2 is R2, R1, Q over 2, Q even, and R1, R2. Q minus one over two R one Q odd. And there's an, an geometrically there's some sort of angle between these complex lines. There's many ways of describing that angle, but there's one particular way of describing it so that that angle is pi over Q, and and we get and we get to so we get these braid relations. And so that we're going to get a. Right. So the analog of my old PQR triangle group when we were talking about it before, is going to be something to do with braid relations satisfying by, but the, that these reflections satisfy. Yeah, so for Q equals 3, we get a traditional braid relation. Uh, R1, R2, R1 is R2, R1, R2. Um, so yes, so maybe e.g. Um, Q equals 2, that implies that R1, R2 commute, so the angle is pi over 2, because the, the complex lines are orthogonal to each other, Q equals 3, R1, R2, R1 is R2, R1, R2, which is the usual braid relation.
Also, something to notice when Q is odd, then R1 and R2 are conjugate, right? Because I can take this R1, R2 to the Q minus 1 over 2, take its inverse over to this side, and then R2 is conjugate to R1. And so that means so they must have the same angles. By angle, I don't mean the braiding angle, I mean the, the reflection angle that we had on that top board. So what's the setup that, uh, that, that we're going to consider? So we're going to consider the groups generated by R1, R2, and R3, complex reflections. For the moment, we're going to say that they all have angle 2 pi over p. At the very end of the talk, I'm going to talk about reflections with different angles. But for the moment, they're going to just have the same angle. And we're going to have, um, oh, I should also have said, if this happens, then I'm just going to write BRQ of R1 and R2. Just to, satisfies the braid, length, braid relation of length 2. And we're going to have what? R2. Going, I'm going to write A, B, C, D, where the braid relation of, of length A between R2 and R3, braid relation of length B between R1 and R3, braid relation of length C between R1 and R2, which would be just an analog of the ABC triangle that we had over there. And as we've already heard in, in I guess, Raphael's talk, um, these, these groups are, are there's still an extra parameter. Um, he used the Cartan invariant uh, following, following Anna. I'm going to, you can also use it in terms of some of these braid relations. And so I'm going to have uh, braid length 2 of R1 and R3 inverse R2, R3. So when I say A, B, C, D and P, this is what this means. So this is, this is a kind of important thing. So it should have gone on the other board, I suppose. So we're going to have, I'm going to give you those, and I'm going to give you that. Okay, so, so Mosto and Deline and Mosto and Livni, I'm just going to write Deline Mosto here. So they had A, B, C, D equal 3, 3, 3, K. And in fact, there's a very nice... Um, survey paper of Mosto where he, he relates these groups to, to mapping class groups and because of, and so points moving around on the sphere and so you would expect to have um, length three braid relations because that's what comes up in mapping class groups. And so I will just say certain P and K. I'm not going to really say much more about that. 
So really, the, the idea that uh, Martin and Julien and I had was, well, what's so special about three? Well, the answer is nothing. And so our examples, we, have, we came up with various families of examples where we had some, some different, um, different numbers. So here we go. Let's just write down a few things. So we have four, 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 three. And I guess then what P was three, four, five, six, eight, and 12. That was a big family. Um, there's five, 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 three, and all sorts of other things, right, and so on. So we also have some, some ones that, where they don't all have the same number, so we could have, so we, we have some things that are sort of three, three, four, n, and um, two, three, uh, n, n, and so on. There's various different examples there. Yes. What do you mean? Well, so, so there are various P's for which this works. For, 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 for various N's and P's. Yeah? You, can, you can look in our paper, or I can give you a complete list later. It really, I could, I could, you know, if I was doing a Beamer talk, I would flash lots of values of P's and N's at you, and you all go, woo! But, uh, but, but as this is a board talk, it's just going to be too much of a waste of time for me to just write down. They're, they're going to get lattices associated. These give you lattices. And, and I guess for this case, those ones were non-arithmetic. If I, Julian's nodding, that's good. OK, but we only have a little bit of time left. So I want to, want to um, talk about another way you can, you can, you can get these lattices. So for, for a long time, we were, all the three of us were, were giving talks about this construction. It was, and people who were kind of connoisseurs of these talks would see the, the progress moving epsilon by epsilon further along. But one of the questions that we almost always get got was, are these groups monodromy groups of anything? And the answer is, yes, they are. So I want to that now talk about higher hypergeometric functions. Actually, I'm not going to talk very much about, about that. Uh, but you can, as a good reference, there's a lovely paper by Boykers and Heckman. But one of the things that they, they write in their paper is, is a criterion due to Levelt. So what, oh, I should say, what do I mean by higher hypergeometric functions? So these are hypergeometric functions associated to an equation of degree bigger than two, so big degree three or more, uh, but only in one variable. So, right, so, so Schwartz had degree two in one variable. Delin and Mosto had degree two in multiple variables. And these are higher degrees in one variable. So they're sort of like in an orthogonal direction. So here, so these are higher degree one variable. OK, so here is a beautiful um, uh, criterion due to Levelt. So if A and B are M by, uh, M by N, I'm using N a lot, so maybe M by M matrices. So that A and B have finite order. And a, B is a complex reflection. Then 
AB is a higher monodromic group. Monodromic group of a higher hypergeometric high function. And, and the N here would be, um, I guess, one plus the number of variables. I guess, so if it's a two by two matrix, these are just monodromic groups. These are the original ones of Schwartz. So it's just a, a clear generalization of Schwartz's. So that's a really, really easy criterion when we've given so much information about these groups. There's just one slight snag. The groups we're considering, these are groups generated with three generators. And these are groups with two generators. And so if I want to try to write one of my three generator groups as a two generator group, then I, there's got to be something going on. And for, for example, the ones where, like I, the examples I just listed, where A, B, and C are all the same, there's an order three symmetry that conjugates R1 to R2 to R3 and back to R1. And so, and then there's so that we're, we're an index either one or three subgroup of the group generated by this symmetry and one of the reflections. That's a nice two generator group. And if the product of my symmetry and the reflection also has finite order, then I automatically satisfy Lavelt's criterion. And that's what happens for, for all the threefold symmetry we want. It just, just drops out. So then theorem. So all... All DM and DPP groups are high monodromy groups. Where star means except possibly um, T E two P for P equals 3, 6, and 12, where, where this means 3, 4, 4, 4. In my ABCD notation. So this is one of the families. It's a more awkward family to deal with. Um, so I could not show that for, for the. Right, we've got three minutes. That should nicely do. So then I, I, I said at the very beginning, there's my, my student, Charlam Promdwang, who just finished his PhD. And one of the projects that I gave him when he started was to investigate groups where the, the, the reflections did not have the same order. And what, do we, what did we decide? We decided that when the, the braid relation was odd, then the, ref the, the reflections had to have the same angle and therefore the same order. So we have to then investigate something where all the braid relations are even. Okay. So he, um, so. So he considered uh, A, B, C equals two, four, four but with different orders. And he nicely started to, to use the algorithm. Well, he looked at, actually looked at some subgroups of that using the algorithm that Martin and Julien and I developed, very much inspired by this 344 case, and came up with a list of criteria that they were needed to satisfy the Poincaré polyhedron theorem. And we started getting out numbers that started to look suspiciously familiar. And 
one of his results is, or he, he was then looking at that normal R for four, four subgroups. And using the Poincaré polyhedron theorem, he came up with some criteria. And they turn out to be exactly the same as the sigma int criteria of Delina Mosto. And it turns out that these are, these are all, um, these are all commensurable. And in particular, the, these people are commensurable to the Lena Mosto groups. I should say they are commensurable too. I should I should have had that. And so that immediately means that I can cross out this, and now it really is all. But one of the fascinating things to me is if I look at the Deleen Mosto groups in there, Deleen Mosto showed that those are monodromy groups of hypergeometric uh, functions associated with equation of degree two and, and, and several variables. What we've shown is, what I've shown is that they're also monodromy groups of hypergeometric functions in one variable and degree three. And I don't know if there's any relationship at all between these two different sorts of hypergeometric functions. And I think that that would be a really interesting question to answer. So if that's a, that's a problem that you can have to solve in the tea break, thank you. <laughs> Yes. If you have your uh, three, three, four, and for different integers, A, B, C, how can you use it? Okay. Um, right. So there's various little tricks that you have to, to you basically, um, yeah, so. So if you have the, all three of them the same, the first three the same, then I've told you how to do that. If you have the first two the same and the last two the same, then, then there's an order two symmetry that I can use and, and that, that I get that. And then if I had uh, three, three, four, n, then I have some sort of little trick for as to how to, how to write this as a subgroup of a, of a, of a two generator group. And then the other one was two, three, n, n. And again, I have another little trick that does it. So there's lots of little tricks, um, just they're very, very elementary tricks, but you just have to, to, to play around with them. Um, yeah, I can't remember off the top of my head. Um, I could, I could, I could look it up and tell you at, at some point later. But, but yeah, there's, there's sort of it, that was the simplest one that I, I, I told you. But, yeah. yeah, I mean they they give a they give a completely explicit way of going from from from, from this. Yeah. It's, it's, it's beautifully explicit, so I can, I can tell you all the parameters associated to these hypergeometric functions just directly from, from reading this. And in my paper, I kind of list, I list what the parameters are. Um, so, so you could, you, know, you really can get your hands dirty with that. Yes? Um, I don't know. Um, so, so um, I, I should say that I mean some of the when Martin was analysing this work of Kuvenberg, Heckman, and Louis Enger, some of our groups came up in their descriptions, and that looks very different, at least 
to my to my eyes. So, so there's a way that they that, that you can see it using their technology. Um, I'm showing you a way to use using this sort of two generator group technology, um, where we were thinking about the, the you know, these complex hyperbolic things. So that you can also um, for some of the groups, you can construct them in terms of line arrangements and, and, and algebraic geometry. Um, which, I mean, I, I decided I wasn't going to talk about any of the, the algebraic geometry side of that, but there's a, there is a completely other side. So there are many ways that these, these groups arise, um, and it's really quite fascinating to me that, that, that they do, and they somehow give you little bridges between these different areas of maths. I don't know whether that was a well-formed enough answer, but... Uh, <laughs> in most cases, general geometry functions give you uh, a quotient, an inverse of a quotient. Get any information the solution to it? Um, I haven't particularly... I mean, I, I can tell you how to construct it, but I haven't really thought about... How, that's a good question, so. Maybe you'd be the sort of person yeah, I would ask. Yeah. I mean, I mean, yeah. You, you so if you, yeah, you, yeah, that, that's right. You can, if you just go through the Boykers and Heckman paper, once you have these sets of parameters, you can you can construct different, and, and you know they give you formulae for how to write these things down. Um, you know, like infinite series and. Um, you know, they're, 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 they're all, you know, the usual hypergeometric thing where you have like things that look a little bit like factorials in, in all the places and they, the fact those depend on the parameters. I, I, I tell you what the parameters are, so you should just be able to write down those, those, those functions. Yeah. Yeah, I know. Yeah, yeah. But, but then, I mean, I'm not quite sure how to fill in the remaining 98 pages. Yes. Um, it, it may do, but we're just not clever enough to build. Fun I mean, we, our main uh, um, way of, of showing these things were discrete and lattices was was to build fundamental domains, and building fundamental domains in two complex dimensions is quite hard. Um, I mean, I've been talking with Irena for some time about how, how we can do this in three complex dimensions, and we have some good ideas, but we haven't yet built a single fundamental domain there properly. Um, but, yeah, if you, can, if you know how to do that, then that should give you... So my, my, you know, my dream would be, if we have lots of these examples, then we can somehow piece them together to build high, higher dimensional uh, non-arithmetic groups, just in the same way that you would piece together Coxeter groups to get higher dimensional Coxeter groups. Not the monodromy. Uh, so the, so the, yeah, but then, so I can, we could write down lots of monodromy groups in this way using the Levelt criterion, but we've no idea whether they're discrete or not. Um, and I've never quite, well, this has been recorded, so I don't know whether I dare say this, but I've never quite understood in the Deline Mosto group how they get discreteness because it's. But yeah, um, if we could, if, so that's a confession <laughs> for, for the public for all time. Um, but perhaps somebody who understands that bit better might be able to do something. But I don't think it's clear. Great. Well, again, on this positive note. Uh... <laughs> okay. Thanks. <laughs> okay. Thank you.